start everyone. <laughs> Let's do this. camera on but mute and unmute is that what you sure. said yeah exactly. okay all right cool Thank you. 
Welcome to the American Red Cross Northern California Coastal Region Speaker Series session. We will begin the program momentarily. Welcome and thank you for joining the American Red Cross Northern California Coastal Region Speaker Series session. My name is David Cruz and I'm honored to be today's moderator. We are thrilled to have you join today's conversation and hope you'll leave more informed and inspired about the work of the Red Cross. Today's session is being recorded and you are in, in listen only mode so we can give our full attention to today's speakers. If you have any questions or comments throughout the session, feel free to submit them in the chat box where I'll review and compile them. Our speakers will try to get to as many of them during our question and answer session towards the end of the program. Today, you'll hear from four outstanding speakers who will share how the Red Cross is responding to COVID-19 and our work in the world of blood services. With that, I'm honored to introduce our first speaker, Jennifer Adrio. Regional CEO of the American Red Cross Northern California Coastal Region. She has been at the Red Cross for over seven years and has been in the role of regional CEO for over a year now, leading a team of more than 5,000 volunteers and approximately 75 employees to provide Red Cross programs and services to more than 10 million residents across 15 counties. Thank you and welcome, Jennifer. Thank you, David. As David shared, I've been with the Red Cross for over seven years now, but there is no other time I've seen this organization more resilient than it is now. We are all experiencing this pandemic for the first time together, unprecedented thunder and lightning causing an unusual amount of fires in the Bay Area for what already has been a tough wildfire season, and the list goes on. Though it's been challenging, I'm so proud to see how adaptable and flexible the Red Cross is for those in need. I want to first start with our disaster response and recovery, which is I'm sure is on top of everybody's mind today. Um, we've been responding to these historic wildfires um, for about 23 days on the Northern California coast. And then in California, Colorado, Montana and Oregon, there are 13 new fires being supported by 21 of the most robust wildfire response teams with the most training experience um, around the country. In Oregon, more than 348,000 acres are burning. In Washington, fires have scorched as many as 330,000 acres in just 24 hours. And in California, at least 25 major fires are burning from Northern California to the Mexican border, and that's about 800 miles in between those fires. While some of the older fires in our area are getting under control, the fast moving Creek fire near Fresno has burned nearly 153,000 acres has seen no containment since it began last Friday. 
And then heavy winds gusts in Northern California led the Bear Fire to spread explosively Tuesday and early Wednesday, forcing more evacuation warnings and orders for at least 20,000 more residents when we've already had 250,000 residents evacuated. And then wildfires are also burning in Utah, Nevada, Arizona, and Idaho. Power outages are growing rapidly due to both public safety shutdowns and fire damage. And the threat isn't over. Much of the western part of the country is still facing critical fire weather conditions, including high winds and hot, dry weather. More than 500 Red Crossers, and most of these volunteers, are working around the clock to provide food, shelter, relief supplies, and comfort to the thousands of people affected by these wildfires. And we will be there for as long as it takes. For our own region, Northern California coastal area, as of Wednesday night, we provided 2,300 people in the region with refuge from the wildfires with emergency lodging, most of those in hotels and some of those in shelters. With COVID in mind, um, we've been preparing for this since March. We're using hotel rooms or dormitory style rooms to ensure people have a safe place to stay if they can't return home. And we do have the need to open congregate shelters at the request of local officials. Additional safety precautions have been in effect. We use health screening measures. We take temperatures. Um, our folks are in PPE. We do social distancing. We have um, isolation rooms. There's all sorts of practices that have been in place that we've actually been preparing for since March, as I had said er earlier. With the help of our partners, the Red Cross has served more than 43,000 meals and snacks and distributed almost 11,000 relief items to the people in need. COVID has also modified our feeding protocols um, and so how we deliver food, we have to deliver them in boxed meals. Um, we can't do food cafeteria style. We're also beginning to provide financial assistance and short-term and long-term recovery solutions to the families this week. Our volunteers have also provided more than 6,000 individual care contacts to help people with medical or disability needs or provide emotional and spiritual support during this challenging time. Taking care of our mental health is so crucial. As you well know, many of our folks have um, experienced wild after wildfire, and many of our own volunteers have been evacuated as well as losing their homes. During the coronavirus crisis, we're providing most of the relief um, services virtually, including our mental health support, which has increased three times since this time last year, and financial assistance. Thanks to investments in items like laptops, wireless hotspots, and mobile devices, we're able to provide more of that virtually. Of course, uh, the wildfires are not the only disaster facing our country today. In our response to Hurricane Laura, nearly two weeks after it devastated East Texas, East Texas and Louisiana, tens of thousands of people are still without power or water and need assistance now. As of Tuesday night, over 1,200 trained Red Cross disaster workers from around the nation are supporting relief efforts, providing 23,000 people with a safe place to stay. Um, dozens of service sites have been set up to help the hardest hit areas to provide water, food, and emergency relief supplies. It's absolutely devastating to see what is happening across the country. But what brings us hope are that the generous donors like yourself enable our amazing volunteers to respond to large storms like Hurricane Laura, the ongoing wildfires along the West Coast, and to even our 3 a.m. house fire calls that happen every evening um, that can turn a family's lives upside down in an instant. It's, an important, it's important to remember that responding to disasters is a team effort and no single organization can do it alone. This is particularly true in this current environment. We work closely with all of our partners, including our donor partners and our government partners um, to provide services. We also do our service to armed forces and international services. On the PowerPoint, you'll see some images and just to remind you that those were pre-COVID since many of our service now are done virtually. We continue to support our military families and veterans with emergency communication messages and online uh, resiliency workshops. We're aiding our communities worldwide through the Red Cross and Red Crescent Network, such as most recently supporting response effort in the TAC and Beirut, Lebanon, which our hearts go out to. And working with the VA, our volunteers are also helping to sew and distribute basic face masks. 
We still continue to do our CPR and life saving courses, CPR, AED, and first aid um, with special safety protocols in place and doing a lot of online learning opportunities. This is also a key because it helps our medical professionals and other workers stay current on their certifications. We continue to push out preparedness information on our response with COVID-19, particularly through our Red Cross emergency app, which is free to everyone. Um, it also helps people prepare for any kind of disasters or anything that may be coming this, their way. So make sure that you have our Red Cross emergency app on your phone. In our government community partnerships, we continue to work closely with our community partners at the local, state and national level. Um, to guide our response efforts, to provide information, to offer feeding support to those in need, and to thank those on the front lines. And finally, with our blood services, which we'll talk more about today, uh, we've had a severe shortage at the beginning of COVID, but our community has just responded amazingly and continues to step up thanks to the ingenuity and quick actions of our blood services team. In just a few minutes, you'll hear from Justin and Dr. Young just exactly how we are doing this. And although COVID has forced us to change how we all serve those in need, the need in our communities remains and our Red Cross mission remains the same. Our communities need us now more than ever, and your support is what allows the Red Cross to be there, even if it's virtually. Thank you for all you do. Thank you, Jennifer. I'd now like to introduce to you Justin Miller. Regional Donor Services Executive of the Northern California Coastal Region. He has been with the Red Cross for 15 years and is also a regular platelet donor, donating over 136 units of blood products. I'll turn it over to Justin to share more about sickle cell disease, the work the Red Cross is doing regionally and how you can get involved. Welcome, Justin. Thank you, David. For starters, I want to thank you all for joining us for these important topics, especially considering all the disasters faced with presently. And I have to give a special shout out to all of our blood donors, supporters, and future blood donors for that matter. As this is clearly something I'm very passionate about. As we all know, September is Sickle Cell Awareness Month. I want to share more information about this and how it relates to blood donations and the testing we're doing. So what is sickle cell disease? Sickle cell disease is a common inherited red blood disorder, but what does that really mean? Generally, healthy red blood cells are round and they flow swiftly through our blood vessels to carry oxygen to all the parts of our body. In the case of someone who may have sickle cell disease, their blood cells become very hard, they get sticky, and they look literally like a C shape or a sickle. The cells die off, they harden, and they can get clogged in the blood vessels and cause a lot of pain and other complications, including acute anemia, tissue and organ damage or failure, respiratory conditions, and even strokes. About 100,000 people of various racial and ethnic backgrounds are living with sickle cell disease today, most of whom are of African or Latino descent. Sickle cell disease occurs in about one out of every 365 Black or African American births and one out of every 16,300 Latinx births. Well, there's no widely used cure for sickle cell disease. The Red Cross supports one of the most critical sickle cell treatments of all, blood transfusions. For many patients, a close blood type match is essential and is found in donors of the same race or of a similar ethnicity. But it is about so much more than the A's, the B's, and the O's. When you donate, in addition to testing for COVID antibodies, we test for specific antigens that are needed to treat sickle cell disease. If your blood contains those characteristics, we will let you know so you can help sickle cell patients just by donating whole blood, plasma, or platelets in the future. Additional information can be found by visiting redcrossblood.org. Now I'd like to switch gears, speak a little bit about our national regional blood services numbers and our overall impact. We are proud to be the nation's single largest supplier of blood and blood products, collecting about 40% of the nation's blood supply. Annually, that adds up to more than 4.7 million blood donations, over 900,000 platelet donations, and nearly 2.7 million volunteer donors, which is incredible. What's even more significant is that each of those numbers symbolizes a story. 
is a person's life that is being saved or extended. Personally, what drew me to the Red Cross is my grandmothers represent two of those numbers. Many, many years ago, as each of their lives were extended by blood products as they battled cancer. The unique thing about blood is it cannot be created or manufactured. We have a saying, the need is constant. Every two seconds, someone in the US needs blood, whether it's for a mother giving birth, accident victims, surgeries, cancer treatments, now COVID, sickle cell disease I spoke of. The harsh reality is chances are you personally know or will know someone who will need blood products. Now, for those of you wondering how things may have changed through this COVID pandemic, pre-COVID, we needed to collect about 13,000 blood donations a day to meet patient needs. Since COVID, we need to collect about 13,000 blood donations a day to meet patient needs. As you can say, the need has remained. Though COVID-19 has challenged us and changed us, we are up to the challenge and are so thankful for our partners who host blood drives. Since March, our region has had to replace more than 200 mobile blood drives that canceled, equating to more than 6,700 units of blood. Pre-COVID, we averaged over 100 blood drives a month in this region. That's more than two months worth of planned blood drives canceling with the flip of a switch as businesses and schools closed their doors as we began to shelter at home. Now our elected officials stepped up in a phenomenal way to help us build awareness, thanks to them and the support of local blood program leaders, including community groups, hospitals, the interfaith community as a whole, and so many others, along with the generosity of our life-saving donors, we were able to fill the void and meet the demand each and every month through this pandemic collected an average of 7,350 units a month here in Northern California. Now also worth mentioning, the FDA has introduced new blood donor eligibility criteria to help us expand the donor pool, specifically reducing deferral periods for men who have had sex with men, malaria, and Creutzfeldt-Jakob, otherwise referenced as CJD or mad cow disease. As the need for blood is constant, we are clearly still collecting blood but we're doing so while enforcing additional safety precautionary measures. Safety protocol now includes collecting blood products by appointment only. We require face masks are worn by all of our staff, our donors and our volunteers alike. We have temperature pre-screening stations upon the entrance into any blood drive operation or facility. We spread out the donor beds, sanitize equipment frequently and often, and maintain at least six feet of distance between donors and staff and volunteers wherever and whenever possible. So now you're asking how you can get involved. Redcrossblood.org is your one-stop shop. You can schedule an appointment to donate blood. I'm gonna tie it back to sickle cell disease. We have that critical need to increase our African-American donors. But even if you're not African-American, you can help be a voice and raise awareness. You can potentially donate convalescent plasma if you've recovered from COVID starting August 31st to help meet the growing need for this product to treat COVID-19 patients. Eligible individuals can now donate their convalescent plasma with the Red Cross every seven days for up to three months. You can donate platelets. You can donate Power Red. You can donate AB Elite. If you have access to a well-lit climate controlled facility with at least 1200 square feet, restrooms and easy load in, plenty of parking, you can host a blood drive. You can make a financial donation. And all of this can be done by visiting redcrossblood.org, which will ultimately allow you to make a difference. With that, I know we're all eager to learn more about how the Red Cross is collecting that convalescent plasma I mentioned and doing antibody testing. So I'm going to ask David to introduce our next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Justin, Thanks, Justin, for sharing that regional update. A lot of great work is being done. Just a friendly reminder to submit any questions you have in the Q&A feature for our speakers. We'll get through as many as we can towards the end of the program. With that, it is my honor to introduce to you Dr. Pam P. Young, Chief Medical Officer of Biomedical Services of the American Red Cross. Dr. Young provides medical guidance, vision, and strategic direction focused on donor and patient safety objectives. She also provides leadership and support to the divisions of scientific affairs and transfusion of innovations, which are engaged in collaborative research with industry, government agencies, and academic centers. 
Prior to joining the Red Cross, Dr. Young served as a tenured professor and medical director of transfusion medicine and the stem cell laboratory at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville. Please help me welcome Dr. Young. Thank you, David. Um, I am delighted to be here with you today uh, to talk about convalescent plasma and antibody testing. The Red Cross has had has been one of the among the first to develop and implement uh, infectious disease testing for blood, and that commitment to blood safety has continued uh, with convalescent plasma. Moreover, uh, we're very committed to partnering with federal agencies and public health uh, organizations to ensure and understand uh, blood safety and also for um, uh, assessment of, uh, of the pandemic. Um, one of the most striking things about this pandemic, this novel coronavirus, is the, the rapidness with which uh, the events progressed. Uh, so just to give you a, a brief timeline, uh, back at the end of December 2019, uh, the WHO informed us of cases of pneumonia of unknown etiology uh, detected in the province of Wuhan. Um, by January, we heard of the first death due to this illness. And um, fast forward to March, uh, the WHO declares COVID-19 as a pandemic. And by March 16th, um, we were already hearing about cases in the west coast of the United States. A lockdown was already in effect. and. This, uh, as Justin mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, resulted in uh, the Red Cross uh, quickly uh, losing uh, large thousands in, uh, of, of blood drives and donations. Next slide, please. So one of the challenges is uh, with COVID-19 is the limited number of known therapies. In fact, um, the only known specific therapy for COVID-19 is COVID-19 convalescent plasma. And uh, this option uh, was funded by the FDA and uh, the FDA uh, issued uh, the ability through an investigational new drug uh, process uh, for patients who are in hospitals to be collect to be treated with convalescent plasma back in late March, early April. Convalescent plasma is collected from patients who have fully recovered from COVID-19 infection and who have uh, made antibodies that might fight this infection. Um, and the, the plasma is collected by a technology called apheresis and the convalescent plasma contain, that contains the antibodies to boost the, the patient's ability to fight the disease uh, can then be transfused to uh, the patient critically ill with COVID-19. Um, though this isn't a proven treatment, uh, there are strong data uh, that initially emerged from China, but have also been added to from data from Italy, uh, as well as the United States, uh, that suggests that, the, that this uh, therapy is uh, helpful, particularly in earlier in disease. In coordination with FDA and industry partners, the Red Cross began collecting convalescent plasma in early April and stood up an entire program in the course of a few weeks. And to this date have, has distributed almost 30,000 units across the nation to support patients. Our goal is to meet hospital demand. And as we go into uh, the fall season where more people tend to stay indoors, um, the 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 scientific community anticipates a rise in cases of COVID-19 and we want very much to meet that demand. Next. <coughs> so 
uh, as a humanitarian organization, um, we want to find other ways to uh, to help with this pandemic. So beginning in uh, mid-June, we began to test all of our blood collections, uh, including platelets and plasma collections uh, for COVID-19 antibodies. Uh, donors can expect to get this uh, information on their test results within seven to 10 days of their donation in either their blood donation donor app or by going into uh, redcrossblood.org. Um, <clears throat> next slide. Um, what, uh, <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, could we go back to one other slide? Um, yes. Um, so what uh, I, I forgot to mention is that, you know, what do these test results mean? A positive test result means that you have been you may have been exposed uh, to COVID-19. And uh, it's important to uh, have that data because about 30% of uh, people who have COVID-19 are asymptomatic and never develop symptoms. A negative test result means that you've never been exposed or it could mean uh, that you're that you haven't developed sufficient antibodies to the virus. Um, a non-available test result means your test results aren't available or wasn't or your sample wasn't tested. Um, so uh, next slide. Um, although the presence of COVID-19 antibodies um, is very important to an individual donor. There are several reasons why we are we're doing this testing. Um, one, it's to better understand uh, this disease uh, and and understand how antibodies uh, will provide immunity to future infection. This has been shown in animal models that antibodies does indeed provide uh, protection, but we need to learn more about the human uh, antibody seroprevalence and its impact on um, immunity. Uh, we are, uh, there are no definite data uh, to suggest that the quantity or concentration of antibodies in an individual relates to how sick they are. In fact, there are emerging data to suggest uh, that a, some asymptomatic individuals can uh, mount a very significant antibody response. Um, Currently, medical experts don't know how long antibodies last uh, after recovering from COVID-19, and uh, our studies will contribute to that understanding as well. And it's important to know that for those blood donors who are receiving a positive antibody test, um, the Red Cross is also asking them to participate in an additional study uh, to better understand the course of their illness, as well as how long these antibodies to uh, last. Next slide. Uh, the Red Cross is participating in a nationwide study that's supported by uh, the Center for Disease Control and includes multiple other uh, organizations. And what we're going to do with through this study is understand the dynamic nature of uh, the disease and uh, which population uh, this uh, antibody can be detected in and for how long. And uh, these studies will be followed up with uh, donors, uh, with donors who are reactive being contacted uh, for further study and further information. Uh, for consistent data sharing, uh, the Red Cross is also sharing our uh, the data we're collecting uh, with state departments of health. Um, this helps the state uh, better understand uh, the dynamic nature of seroprevalence in their own state and also to corroborate uh, other testing data that they are receiving uh, to understand where, where more resources might be needed. We'll also be providing summary uh, de-identified testing data to uh, such states and health organizations uh, so they can react better uh, to uh, the disease in their state. Next slide. So uh, the results to date, as I mentioned, uh, we have been testing our all blood donors since mid-June. We've tested over 1 million uh, donors in 44 states, and our reactive rate is between 1.8 and 1.9%. This percentage of positive antibodies is fairly consistent with the national average of about 2%.
Next slide. Um, I will pass that back to you now, David. Thank you, Dr. Young, for providing this valuable information. Our audience has has some great questions that we'll get to during our Q&A portion towards the end of the session. At this time, I'm happy to introduce Ropeep Ban Santos. Ropeep hails from Cambodia and is a mother to three beautiful children, is a wife, a sister, and a daughter. We are proud to have her as part of our American Red Cross Biomedical Services Department for over 17 years, where for 15 of those years, she has been a team supervisor. You may have gotten a sneak peek of Ropeep's story in the, in the video with CNN news anchor Brooke Baldwin, but we would love for her to share her story with you. Ropeep, take it away. Thank you so much, David, for the introduction. Hello, everyone. As David shared, my name is Ropeep Santos, and I've been with the Red Cross for about um, 17 years now. Um, I've started working at the Red Cross directly after college at a local blood um, mobile drives, collecting whole blood, power reds, and plasma. I started off as a technician, and with the opportunity and growth that was presented with ARC, I became a team supervisor within a year and a half and an instructor. So I wanted to share with you why I stayed with the American Red Cross for about seven years. And I hope you guys have your tissue ready because I'm about to cry. <laughs> Um, when my older sister was 13 years old, she was diagnosed with arterial venous malformation on her face. Whew. Which is the tumor growth on her face. Now this was a rare um, first diagnosis that was recognized at UCSF. She initially had the tumor removed as it was very small. Unfortunately, it came back. She chose to continue school as the tumor was not affecting her at the time. But during her two years of college, she decided to undergo another surgery to remove to remove the tumor as it was getting larger and it was causing concern since it was around her neck. This was my first time donating blood for her surgery at the age of 16. <sighs> the evening of the surgery, we received a call and she wasn't going to make it. A one day surgery became two days with multiple set of doctors and nurses exchanging shifts to try to save her life. During the surgery, she received over 20 pints of blood. Imagine over 20 pints. They had to cut the surgery short to save her life. For one year and a half, her face was open. Her half face was open. So at the age of eight, 16, I had to change her dressing and give her regular shots. 23 years later, at age 45, on Christmas Eve in 2015, my older sister was diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia, a type of blood cancer she was not she was not her usual self before we brought her in. The doctor told us that her blood level was low at level three. And if she, if we didn't bring her in that evening, she would not have made it the next morning. They gave her three bags of units to bring her back to a level seven. Through the many months, of chemo and radiation, my sister received whole blood, platelets, and plasma transfusions every other day. 
because of this, I was determined to learn more about the cancer and the process behind it. She needed about eight transfusions per week for her treatment, which of course includes not only blood, whole blood, but also platelets and plasma. <clears throat> Other than the transfusion, the family was determined to find a bone marrow match, which we did. As I was staying with her in the hospital and watching her receive the many transfusions, I was amazed of the different blood components and their functions. I only knew about whole blood and very little about plasma. As I was sitting in the hospital, the stars had just aligned everything for me. I was able to transition over to collecting platelet apheresis from donors that walked through a Red Cross doors. Now, this is a medical procedure that involves collecting blood from a donor and separating the blood into individual components. So the particular components can be reintroduced into the patients. Unfortunately, my sister passed away from leukemia four years ago in 2016. Just shy of one year from her diagnosis. I am thankful, very thankful for the donors who took the time to come in to donate blood, the staff that works to collect them, the manufacturers who work endless hours processing the blood products, and those who are behind the scenes. I am thankful that because each and every one of you don't know how powerful your work is. Because of all the hands involved, from donating blood to the transfusion, the power of all the hands on deck gave my sister an opportunity to extend her life long enough for her to meet my youngest boy and spend time with him for 10 months, which we thought we would not have the opportunity to see him at all. Most recently, one of the projects I'm so proud of to support is under a convalescent plasma team. We traveled to the East Coast for 14 days when New York and New Jersey were the hot spot to help collect plasma from recovered COVID-19 patients. As Dr. Young had explained, one of those patients was C CNN News correspondent Brooke Baldwin. I've heard many stories from our donors that came in those two weeks just sharing their family members who had gone through COVID and their experiences. So back on October 3rd, Brooke got COVID and for two weeks was just in pure pain. She finally took a turn, received the all clear and was able to go back to work. However, she was determined to turn this terrible experience into something good. She learned of what the American Red Cross was doing in collecting plasma that would in turn help three patients desperately in need and document her journey. Meeting Brooke was very exciting, but also seeing how Brooke was an advocate for this process was inspiring for it being her first time doing anything like this. And we'll share the link to her journey after the session so you can view it. But I'm forever grateful for the Red Cross and so humble and proud of our team. And not just because I work here, but also because the work the Red Cross is doing to save lives and the impact it does. Though my sister passed, she lived long, longer because of the blood products, the platelets and the plasma donation. The Red Cross is that conduit to help three patients for every one blood or plasma donor like Brooke. For those who need blood because of a car accident they were in, for those who have been in hospitals because of a surgery, or cancer patients who continuously depend on the blood products every day, and for the moms who may need the transfusion during the their delivery, your blood donation is essential. Your time is essential. And because the extended time my sister had, 
it gave us an opportunity to share to share with those times with each other and making every moment count. So I wanted to thank you again for all the support that you have given to us, to the team, to the patients out there. We appreciate you. So thank you so much for all you do. Thank you, Roby, for sharing your powerful story and experience. Your story resonates with so many of us, and we thank you for all that you're doing to support our country where the need is the greatest. Thank you once again to all of our speakers for providing such valuable information. We've had a lot of great questions come in that we'll jump right into. This question is for Justin. My husband and I both had COVID and both donated plasma. It took us a very long time to get someone to call us back and finally make an appointment. Is there any way of expediting the process? Yeah, David, uh, as this was a brand new line of product for us to collect, there were undoubtedly pressure points and learning opportunities along the way. And I'll say this was certainly one of them. Uh, improvements in contacting and scheduling donors is ongoing, but the realistic target is donors should be contacted via phone and scheduled now within three days. Um, and that's also now what is listed on the website. Thank you, Justin. This next question is for Jennifer. What is the most pressing need we can promote through our social media channels and companies, whether it's remote or in person? Yeah, it's a great question, David. So I think you know you just heard an amazing, powerful story about blood donations, and I think we never know when we might need those. And I think the easiest thing to do is to ask people to consider donating blood. The number one reason people don't give is because they haven't been asked. And so you can help share that message through your social media. You can go to redcrossblood.org. There's all sorts of great tools to help you connect with others that way. You can encourage people to host blood drives. And of course, um, reaching out for diverse blood donors, uh, African-American blood donors specifically, and educating around sickle cell awareness are, are the two things that we would really love your help around. Thanks, Jennifer. Dr. Young, this question is for you. What is the status of the use of plasma from recovered coronavirus donors? And would the Red Cross consider participating when there is a vaccine rollout? Um, so uh, we are indeed uh, actively collecting um, plasma from uh, from donors who have fully recovered and who are otherwise eligible to donate. Um, I hope that was the question uh, because absolutely there is a, a continued need. Um, there are continued uh, uh, efforts to to ensure that we have enough product going into the fall season. So I encourage everyone who has recovered from COVID-19 to come in and donate. Um, in terms of the vaccine um, trial, um, I don't believe that the Red Cross as an organization will participate in um, the phase three, uh, you know, portion of, of any uh, vaccine trial, um, but we are um, very much, uh, you know, updating uh, ourselves on the status of these trials because it very much impacts eligibility to donate and uh, eligibility uh, regarding convalescent plasma donors as well. That So we're keeping a close eye on that, but we're not participating directly. Thank you, Dr. Young. Robeep, uh, you're receiving a lot of appreciation in the Q&A feature. Um, but the question for you is, what words of hope or encouragement do you have for people who are going through an experience like you did? Who? Where do I start? Um, I have to say, I pray a lot. And let me be real with you. There are moments I was like upset, mad, disappointment. And it was just eating me alive. And it's not easy and it doesn't get easier. So with my father's help, I had to like change my focus. I count my blessings every day. I learned to build my relationship with my father, with love, with kindness, um, and especially forgiveness, which is really hard to come by. And I cherish the little moments and take it one day at a time. You know, and 
remembering to reach out because we need each other. We're not alone. We, and we can't, we can't do this by ourselves. And we have to remember that. And we have friends and family and my coworkers and staff have been so supportive of me during this time. Um, my sister and I am. Um, it's one needle. Um, it's easy peasy, and um, it actually saves. Uh, we can separate into two bags, and it can actually go to two separate different patients. And if you have great veins for it, come in and donate the power red because we need your red cells. And for donors who are prone to donating um, or to fainting, you know. All the staff are very experienced and they'll take great care of you. We had a donor that actually came in and um, the first few times um, this donor was extremely nervous and was also prone to fainting. And after she got used to donating blood, we were there for her at every step of the way. And the staff are wonderful and um, you'll be taken care of. And there's if it's not for you, you can volunteer. We need all the volunteers that we can get, um, and it really helps with our um, line staff. And um, there's other opportunities that you can help out too, um, other than blood donations. And um, if you go to redcross.org, um, there's a tab up there that you can look at. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ropi. This next question is for Dr. Young. In light of blood donor shortages referable to the pandemic, has there been any further discussion about allowing male patients with very low risk prostate cancer who are on active surveillance only to donate blood? Um, that's a great question. Uh, uh, we uh, have, uh, you know, Justin discussed this, uh, recently changed uh, a lot of uh, eligibility criteria uh, in response to new uh, FTA guidances, uh, which shortened um, a lot of the deferral periods uh, for uh, certain risk categories, uh, such as tattoos and other things. Um, and also, uh, like you mentioned, CJD, um, we have not changed the criteria around uh, cancer, including prostate cancer, also including early stage prostate cancer. Um, so uh, we are have not done that and there are no plans to do that at this time. Thank you, Dr. Young. Here is a question for Justin. I gave a double red donation a couple of weeks ago, but I did not hear anything about COVID testing. Do you know if I was tested? Will I receive results? Yeah, so if the donation took place a couple of weeks ago, then it was tested um, for the anti or with the antibody test. And as, uh, as Dr. Young mentioned, the easiest way to receive those results is to go to redcrossblood.org or you can download the app and view them right there on your app. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. And to follow up, um, is there an age limit you disqualify a blood donor at? It's a great question, and the simple answer is no. Um, really, all of the eligibility guidelines are, are put forth the way that they are, and um, there is no upper age limit. Um, that said, we would ask that, that all donors um, do double check as donating blood is really a privilege, and uh, really about 39% of the population is eligible to donate. So other factors worth consideration would be medication um, and travel deferrals, but no upper age limit. Thank you. Thanks, Justin, and these questions keep coming. Uh, this one is also uh, to you. For a person's first blood donation, what is the suggested type to give? Platelet, power red, et cetera? Yeah, so for the first donation, we would start you off with whole blood. 
Um, and at that point, then depending on your blood type and uh, just other needs that we have with our inventory, we would want you to come back and then donate uh, the product that is needed the most during that time. Um, you know, when we start talking about uh, the different product lines, platelets, uh, power red, we really need to factor in blood types and other other specifics. So to get started, whole blood is the uh, is the best choice. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. There are no more questions being presented at this time, so I want to thank you all for the wonderful questions today. We are running close to time with a few minutes remaining. I'd like to have Jennifer wrap up today's session with a few closing remarks. Jennifer? Yeah, I just want to say thank you to each of you for joining us today. Uh, we appreciate you being part of how we uh, deliver our mission every day. We can't do it without you. Um, continue to support our work. If you want to consider donating for disaster relief, as you know, we've got plenty of those disasters going on around the country. Uh, we appreciate your support. If you want to help with, out, uh, with blood donations, you know how to do that as well. So reach out to any of us. Um, we're here to support you in, in helping um, to help others and I know as you were, I was totally moved by Rabeep's um, bravery and uh, sharing her personal story and then just her commitment to the work that she does. Uh, it's truly moving. So thank you again to each of you for participating today and thank you to our speakers. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you once again to our amazing speakers for a wonderful discussion and to everyone who joined us today. Keep an eye out for a follow up email with the recording for this session, along with a quick survey to gather your input. This now concludes today's session.